Yeah, look, it's, it's actually quite consistent in Australia with the rest of the world where, where consumers are drinking less but drinking better is the terminology we use. So, yes, they're drinking less bottles of wine, being more health conscious, et cetera. But when they do, they purchase high-priced wines. Um, they certainly enjoy wine at home and the occasion more often as well. So we think that's a good trend. It's certainly we're shifting our business to take advantage of that. And more white wines are being consumed, more sparkling wine, which, again, yeah, means you need a broader portfolio. So it's still a big category, but certainly changing. You touched on the restructure of your business. So the drop in wine consumption, along with a global glut of wine, played a big part in the company's decision to divest those lower priced labels, such as Lindemann's? Our centre of gravity of our strategy and our business now is, is luxury wine. I mean, 80% of our earnings and you know, our investments and acquisitions have all been in that space. So, you know, for us, you know, a lower end, lower price commodity, um, you know, commodity category like commercial wine, yeah, we are, we're not as competitive as we need to be. So for us, it makes sense to divest that. It's a small part of our earnings and we'll, we'll improve our margin structure, you know, when we do do that transaction. So it's in line with strategy, but the category itself is pretty challenged at that price point. Are there implications, though, if the market is currently skewed towards older Australians who've long enjoyed wine and can afford a decent drop? Yeah, well, it, it, it is the younger consumer is coming into wine at a much higher price point than what it ever did. Um, so, you know, whereas historically it might have been at five, six, seven dollars a bottle, now it's 15, 17, 18 dollars a bottle. The younger consumers are much more conscious of quality and um, they're much more conscious of brand um, than what we've seen historically. So bringing younger people into wine has been a challenge forever and a day. That's not new news. And we're, we're pretty good at innovating to bring them into the category. But, um, you know, they're certainly entering at higher price points and certainly, certainly my generation did. Most of the company's profit comes from the US portfolio. There's been a big expansion with the acquisition of Dow in the Napa Valley. What do you say to those questioning why you've made such a big bet in the US where you have had mixed success in the past? The, the underpinning reason is that the US is the world's largest luxury wine market. And, uh, you know, we've been doing business there for a long time. Not always successfully over the last 20 years. That is uh, absolutely true. But we have a portfolio of luxury brands that we've now added to with Dow. That means we're the number one luxury wine company in the United States now. We're you know, having significant scale in the world's biggest market. Um, you know, we believe gives us a great advantage to, to really take advantage of where the consumer is going. And uh, you know, to be a global competitor in luxury wine, you have to be successful in the US. And now we're starting to see that really pay off. Now, finally, you have declared that the company is on track to meet its goal of using 100% renewable energy at its wineries by the end of this year. What have you learned about this process and what advice can you give other companies pondering the renewable transition? Yeah, look, I think uh, it, it takes a lot of different levers to pull to achieve it. And, uh, you know, two and a half years ago, we were at close to 0%. So, yeah, we think uh, engaging with your teams to come up with different projects and ways to do this, not just big capital expenditure, yeah, has been the secret to our success. I think we would have got to 80, 90 percent um, without that. But that last 10 percent comes from our people within and the, and the work they've done to really innovate to, to drive this solution. So it's a really fantastic, engaging way to build a culture around it within your organisation. That's been the trick for us. OK, and you've still got a little further to go. You do, pa you do plan to power your transport, your vehicles uh, with batteries in the near future? Yeah, once we, once we get through uh, our current commitments in uh, the end of this fiscal 25, we move to the, the scope, certainly scope two emissions for ourselves, which includes our own fleet. Um, we outsource a lot of that, which will be our scope three work, which we work through between 2025 and 2030. So, you know, we get our own house in order and then we feel as a, we can play the leadership role then to, uh, to really influence others to get their house in order. But we've got to do ours first. OK, Tim Ford, great to speak to you. Thank you very much.